Hi everyone and welcome to part 4 of this series in linear model selection and regularization. So, so far we've covered a lot of things. We've seen models that try to find a subset of variables that are relevant for the fitting and I've called this brute force because basically we are trying different combinations of the regressors in order to have a simplified version of the model but with high accuracy. The second type of models that we've discussed are those models that I call models in retrospect, in which we have this idea of using one parameter and that parameter is allowing us to shrink in the coefficients naturally, so we have a kind of automatic model selection without using any correlation between the variables. And today we're going to discuss the third type of, of methods and I'm going to call these methods methods in advance because basically what we are doing is transforming the predictors in order to have better accuracy. So we are not choosing parameters, we are not letting the data tell us what parameters are more relevant. What we are doing here is basically create a new set of variables, a new set of predictors. And the idea is that those predictors are linear combinations of the old ones. And instead of using a regression between the output and the original variables, we're doing a regression between the output and these new variables. The idea is that instead of using n predictors, we're going to use just p. And we are going to draw from p plus 1 to n. So let me show you this graphically. So imagine that I tell you which photo captures better the difference among soldiers. So this photo is not very good because we have a lot of overlapping, this is a little bit better, and this is clearly the best. So let's try to think about this in terms of variables. So imagine that we have two variables, x1 and x2, and here you can see that the differences between different soldiers are collected in this direction, and the same here and the same there. So if you compare the lengths of the, the, the range of variability of these three photographs, you can see that the, the last one has the direction of maximum variability. So we can distinguish better the soldiers if we move in this direction better than this direction or the other one. This is the idea behind principal component analysis, that is a technique that we are going to use later in the course. But today I'm, I'm just going to mention that because there is this technique called principal component regression, in which principal components are these rotations of the parameters and then used for regression. So the idea is to try to find combinations of x1 to xn that has the most variation and we are going to rotate in a, in a given sense. So basically we are taking these predictors like for instance population or advertising spending and we are going to manipulate this, uh, these variables and manipulation I mean simply rotation by a linear combination of those and we are going to find new predictors and these predictors are called principal components or they are also called eigen predictors and the idea is that the, in, in the new variables we have the highest variability here and the lowest variability in the, in, the, in the different directions. So this is kind of similar than transforming this sort of photograph into this photograph. This idea of PCR is super useful in unsupervised training, but not going to use it for a couple of problems. The first problem is that the new variables are not easy to interpret. So here clearly population and advertised spending is something that you can explain to a client, but it's really hard to explain this idea of principal components, which are linear combinations of the parameters. If you have two parameters, sometimes you can find an easy explanation, but it's not so easy in, in other situations. The second problem has to do with, with the idea that PCA is optimized for finding the directions in which variability is optimized. But this doesn't mean that we are optimizing the, the regression. So this direction of maximum variability is related to the predictors, but it's not related to the output. And sometimes, like in this example, sometimes R squared is even worse than with the original parameters. Anyway, this suggests us an idea. So what if we include Y in this rotation method? So let me show you the main idea. So in step one, basically we are doing the same old uh, linear regression. So our predictors are the original ones and the output is the original one. And, and we are doing this regression and we are extracting this parameter. So, so far nothing new. This is the idea. So instead of playing with Y in the future, we are going to create a new set of outputs. And this output is kind of the Y predicted that you've used in different videos. So we're taking these coefficients, multiply those coefficients by the initial predictors, and they construct this new output, okay? In step three, we are going to do a, a new regression. And, and this is really interesting because we are doing regression between the old predictors and the new output. Okay, you can see here that this output is something that is a kind of combination of the original ones. And we are going to update the new X, uh, XJ as the residual of the new prediction. And in step four, we are doing more or less the same. So we are creating a new regression between the original output and this new candidate for output, let's say. And then the new output is going to be the residual. So with this idea, basically, we are trying to minimize this part. So uh, when we iterate, basically, we are reducing over and over again these residuals, the deltas, the epsilons, and the epsilon y. And the idea is that after a few iterations, we have a good reconstruction of the original model. So let me show you an example. 
So here we have some data. I'm going to use cross-validation and the method PLS uh, within this train in, uh, function in the carrot library. So you can see that this data set, and you can download this code from the description, has to, uh, 228 predictors, which is a lot. But cross-validation tells us that using PLS, the, the optimal solution has just 18. So basically, if you plot the output of the, the, of, of the cross-validation training, you can see that the root mean square of error is minimized more or less for 18 co uh, components. So we have reduced from 228 to 18 components. So as I was saying, the price we have to pay for this is the lack of interpretability, because these uh, new uh, regressors are these linear combinations over and over again, so we don't know exactly where they are. But, but you can say that I, I think it's a good pay price to pay because we're reducing a lot of the dimensionality of the problem. And actually, if you take a look at how the prediction fits with respect to the data, you can see that the prediction with 18 parameters is really good, taking into account that we have dropped to 110. If you take a look at the residuals, this looks pretty nicely. So this is a kind of normal distribution. So as I was saying, we have a lack of interpretability, but the price is, is a good price to pay. Okay, how do PCR and, and PLS compare? As I was saying, PC, PCA is trying to maximize variability of the inputs, and PLS is trying to maximize variability, including the output. So, so this is the explanation why you have this good uh, regression in, in the case of PLS. Yeah. Oof, we've covered a lot of material in this video, so let me give you my take on all of these methods. So this is my choice. If you're playing with a small data set, I would say that methods like the best subset selection or RFE RF are the, the, the most suitable ones because basically we're dropping some variables and we're still keeping a lot of information but not at the expense of a large computational effort. You have large number of regressors, these methods are not useful because the, com the computation is huge. And then methods like PLS are really interesting. As you have seen in the, the examples in this video, you can drop from 228 predictors to just 18 Eigen predictors. But if you're looking for interpretability, my, my choice would be to use Lasso. And Lasso has some problems of stability. So I would say that the elastic net with an alpha almost zero. Remember that alpha is this parameter that is interpolating between, uh, between pure rich regression and pure lasso. So even with alpha equals to 10 to the minus 3, you have all the benefits of lasso and all the stability provided by rich regression. But remember one of the main themes in this course that never use only one method. Try a few and make your own, your own choices. So you have to create your, you have your toolbox and you have to create your own decisions on, on how to deal with the data.